Jason Lockenfura of CBS Sports, CBS NFL Insider. Everybody thinks it's a done deal. Uh, Kyler Murray to the Cardinals. Do you agree with that, Jason? I, I think he's going to be the first overall pick. I, 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 I'm not going to say that I absolutely positively know that they will make that pick. You know, I, I, I still think that uh, a trade is always a possibility. Um, but no doubt Kyler Murray is the story of this, of this combine, and all he did is stand there and get measured. Um, and it's, it's crazy. Uh, I mean, someone asked me earlier today, like, you know, you've, what's the story of this combine? What's different from, from this combine about others you've covered? I'm like, I never can recall the potential first overall pick being a kid who scouts basically didn't even talk to in, you know, October as they went through his school because he wasn't viewed as a draftable commodity. Because by the time we're at the combine, he's going to be in, like, Peoria, Arizona or whatever. You know what I mean? With the A's minor leaguers getting ready to play in the California State League. Like, it's – this is a new one, but it's happening. Well, I mean, we're watching him uh, while you were going uh, through your, your first statement there, Jason, watching video, and I'll describe to the radio audience, of him running around uh, to avoid the rush and then making spectacular plays with his legs. And we all know he can make some incredible throws as well. But you hit on something there. The evaluation of Kyler Murray, I mean – uh, what did you hear about the evaluation of him at the combine? Not the eye in the sky stuff, the stuff when they could look at him in the eye and talk about it uh, with him or anything else going down, Te- any testing that he did in fact undergo, because as you point out, scouts didn't even take a look at him. They were assuming he was going to baseball. They assumed at five, nine or whatever he was that they weren't going to take him anyway. And then his tape has made everybody feel differently. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, he, he obviously started meeting with teams and, and interviewing with teams. I didn't hear anything drastic one way or the other. Um, you know, I, I, as teams put him on the board, they're going to have to be uh, – And well, we're saying all this, but, like, the reality is it's, he's probably going to one team, right? And they already know he does exactly everything they need him to know. And, like, so I, I almost feel like I'm wasting my breath here. because. But, but teams still have to do all their evaluations. So, yes, he'll have a pro day, and, yes, he'll make personal visits. Um, and people will put him on the board, and there'll be um, varying degrees of comfort about if he could do what we need him to do, and how much would we have to do to meet him with what he can do, and what how you know how does our our protection shape up, and is he going to have the kind of time and space that he got in Oklahoma, where at times their line was men against boys. So there's all these different mental calculations that go into it, um, and and but at the end of the day, like. I think we all know what Cliff Kingsbury probably thinks of him, right? Um, so, Is it his call? Is it his call, Jason? I mean, that's the interesting aspect of this, too, is you've got an organization that just won and done their coach, a general oh, yeah. manager, a general manager um, who had uh, off the, I guess, outside of the building issues, um, oh, yeah. and an owner that is no doubt antsy to get uh, some sort of buzz going on with the franchise, despite Josh Rosen can't really evaluate how good he is based on, uh, let me get this right, 52 sacks allowed last year by an offensive line. So uh, what about the intrigue with Arizona here playing into all this? Well, at this point, you would have to believe that Steve Keim and Cliff Kingsbury are joined at the hip with this. I mean – you can't tell me that as they're talking to Cliff Kingsbury and through that interview process and, and, you know, going out with the owner and, you know, having five hour dinners and all that, that the prospect of this didn't come up. So if this is what they end up doing, taking, you know, a baby quarterback first overall to replace the baby quarterback, they just took 10th overall, what, not even 11 months ago, you would have to assume that that was part of a master plan and part of the reason why when you have the first overall pick, you know you can control the draft. And, and if this guy thinks, if this coach thinks enough about Kyler Murray and what he can do to help this system translate in the pro game, then you would have to assume that the genesis and origins of that came then. But to your larger point about what's going on in that organization, um, for anybody to try to judge Josh Rosen on what he was thrust into, where the dude who picked him is getting an extreme DUI and literally is like in jail and then suspended while you're getting your feet wet. And he's Rosen's not the one who gave what 25 odd million dollars guaranteed to Glennon and Bradford. And he's not the one who put together that Frankenstein staff and fired 
you know, Mike McCoy like six weeks into the season, right? And he's not the one who then parted with that staff that the Cardinals pretty much put together because it's not like Steve Wilkes came in there with a ton of his own ideas and like a group of 15 guys, you know, who are coming with me. It's not like he was putting the band back together like Gibbs 2.0 or Gruden 2.0, you know, 2.0 now in Oakland. And then the quarterback has to play before he's ready, and then you don't know how to use the running back anymore, and he's got nobody to throw to other than Larry Fitzgerald, and the offensive line is, is getting eaten alive. Like, I think if they do what everybody thinks they're going to do now is take this other quarterback first overall, it begs the question, why did you do what you did last year? Like, what the bleep was that? Was it a move of any conviction whatsoever, or was it just that, like, you know, one of the three of these quarterbacks are going to go in like you know the top seven or eight, and then we got to get to ten because Oakland's open for business to get whichever one of those four. You know, whichever one isn't one of the first three and also isn't Lamar Jackson. Like, is that is that what that was? Because if that's not what that was, then it would be really easy to put the Kyler Murray stuff to bed right now and just go ahead and trade off that pick or whatever mm. and start throwing your arms around Josh Rosen. Man, I mean. Does Murray have I mean, it to handle it? Wrong, but no, no, I mean, no, no, I no. But those, those were all statements of fact. So these are, but you put the Jason Lock and Forey here on the Rich Eisen show. Then you put every egg in the Kyler Murray basket, and you're hoping that he is he is the next sliced bread guy, because that, that the I tape mean, that the tape that we yeah, saw I mean, in it, Oklahoma it, it, emerges it, it, in the it, NFL. It, and you're you're also selling incredibly low again on a kid you just moved up to take first overall. Um, and, like, don't try to – that wasn't a Steve Wilkes move. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, don't try to tell me, like, the offensive coordinator who you fired, like, I don't know, 20 quarters into the season, you know, like, he was – no. I mean, that was an organizational move. I mean, that, mm. that's Bidwell and Steve Kime. There's no other way to put it. So then I guess, in a way, they're, they're lucky that, that Kyler Murray comes in, and if he is that special, he could change this whole thing around really quick. Or they just – I, I've never seen the number of people that just swear this is absolutely going to happen coming out of the combine, that the next few weeks just do not and matter. I, and again, I just, just to be clear, I am not saying that, but I, I hear plenty of people who are and people, coaches and executives with other teams are utterly convinced of it. And if they, if that's the case and it works, who cares? Of course. And if well, that's no, not the case and they help fan the flames of Kyler Murray to the point where two or three other teams feel like they got to go to one to get a quarterback, then good for them. You know, and they turn it into a Bafo trade to fill the 9,000 holes in their Swiss cheese roster. But if it's not either of the two, take it in conjunction with everything that's kind of going on there since the demise of the Bruce Arians era. Um, and even before that, I mean, you know, paying, paying Carson – uh, Palmer, when they didn't have to, probably waiting a year too long to make the move for the quarterback again, unless they trade out of you know one and build around Josh Rosen. Um, yeah, you look at all that in its totality, and you say there's a reason some teams win in this league, and a reason some you know some don't. Jason Locken for a few more minutes left with him. The Antonio Brown stuff. Where does that stand? New league year opens next week. Does he go somewhere? Yeah, he does. I, I can tell you this. They won't dump him just to dump him to get around the roster bonus. I mean, at this point, they're all in on taking the $20 million cap hit and having Antonio Brown be something of a sunk cost. So they're not going to just ship him for a five, you know, oh, let's just get rid of him before, you know, before we have to pay him any roster bonus or anything like that. That won't be a factor. Um, his actions haven't helped them. You know, it's, it's, it's taken um, – a market that a lot of people thought would form in a fairly robust manner, and it, it's turned it into sort of a, a you know a, 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 a dribble here and a dribble there. But I still think they can get better than a third round pick for him. I, I think they can get a second round pick for him. Uh, Oakland's got a ton of picks. Um, you know the Eagles have been monitoring that situation, and there's not too many deals made in this league that Howie Roseman doesn't at least consider making himself for players of this caliber. Um, you know. Washington, maybe. I, I hear there's a split in that organization about, you know, whether this really makes sense for them right now. Um, but ultimately, if Dan Snyder gets his way, and he, and he does, I don't think you could completely rule them out by any stretch. Um, hmm. But, yeah, it's not, it's, it, it's not what it, it could have been had he handled this differently and, frankly, had they handled it differently. So Foles is uh, to Jacksonville. That's the scuttlebutt coming out of – the combine is that 
Is that as done a deal as everyone's referring to? I mean, it's it's like Connor Murray's going to be Arizona's guy and Foles is going to be Jacksonville's guy. That's basically the two certainties, uh, along with death and taxes, uh, coming out of, of the combine. And you were in the 40. Uh, yeah, that's that too. Sure. I almost didn't, uh, almost DNF. I, I, I wouldn't write it in Sharpie, Rich. I would write it in pencil. Um, but there's, you know, there, there's some dynamics inside that organization at play. And he's not, you know, the only game in town. There, there is a draft coming up, and, and while maybe they'd have to move up to get one of the top two, they wouldn't have to move up all that much. And Teddy Bridgewater, last I checked, he's still 26 years old and, um, you know, has won playoff games in the league. And, um, you know, if you, you've got a Tyrod Taylor out there who's been to the playoffs himself. Um, so it's not as if, the, the, you know, it's, it's Nick Foles or, or bust. And I don't know of an agreement that's in place yet. And so uh, until that happens, I would say, um, you know, stay tuned. Tom Coughlin is, is clearly in charge there. There were people in that building who I, I was told felt like a trade for Flacco might make sense, but Tom Coughlin, you know, wasn't one of them, and, and that didn't happen. Um, there's a bit of a split on this right now, and, and I think Coughlin, who's empowered there, you know, I mean, he, 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 again, clearly is running things. I think him, maybe some of these, one of these young quarterbacks, particularly Ohio State, he can fall in love with and, and, and be cool with that. Other people there know if they don't win more games, they're definitely going to be out the building after the collapse of last season. Uh, so, uh, you know, and at what price point? Nick Foles as well. You know, is it, hey, Nick, take it or leave it, man. Um, we're going to give you a base of 15, and you can earn another five in incentives if you do what you did in Philly. You know, I, I don't know that that $25 million figure that was out there on the franchise tag, I don't know if that factors in for Nick Foles. Mm-hmm. And then last one for you, Lev Bell. Uh, the, that's the one thing that I was hearing is look out for the Colts with their uh, monster cap room that that he he might wind up there in Indianapolis. That's what I heard when I left the building. What do you think? I don't think that's what Chris Ballard does. I, I think the culture he's trying to build there and the little engine that could and knowing what he has in Andrew Luck um, and they ran the ball. You know, I'm not saying Marlon Mack is, is Le'Veon Bell, but – they, they liked the, some of the different types of backs they have and the different ways they can skin that cat. I, I hear much more about them on wide receivers than I do about Le'Veon Bell. And certainly if they can get their hands on pass rush, that's a priority. And defense more than anything else is I think if he's making a, a big ticket item like that, I think it's a receiver and or a defensive which, player. Which receiver? Be a corner which receiver? You know, or a pass rusher. Um, which you know, re- I, I, I think the Raiders maybe. With Le'Veon Bell, um, you know, I, I think uh, – Jets? And, you know, a lot of talk about the Jets, but, but what I've heard lately is that the Jets would be content to go with Tevin Coleman if, this, if Le'Veon Bell's money goes anywhere near where he wants it to go. I personally don't think it gets to that stratosphere. And what about – which receivers are, are red hot do you think that the Colts would be on or others would be on? I think the Colts would be looking at an outside receiver like Tyrell Williams from the Chargers, who I hear Oakland is very hot on as well. And then all these slot guys are going to do well. It's just which flavor do you like and at which price point. You know, you've got, you've got Golden Tate. You've got the kid Humphreys in Tampa who really started emerging um, in that offense the last year or so. Uh, you've got Cole Beasley who, you know, he's 30, which isn't ideal, but he's also been really, really productive in an offense – um, that didn't utilize him the way one like, you know, New England might. So, uh, you know, uh, did I mention Golden Tate? I mean, there's, there, there's a bunch of guys who primarily do their work in the slot. I think who are all going to fall somewhere um, between, you know, nine-ish a year all the way up to, um, in the case of Tyrell Williams, an outside guy. Um, I, I would not be shocked if he was in the twelve, thirteen million dollar a year range. Lock, good to see you in Indianapolis, and um, you know, best of luck to uh, balance life uh, and uh, business over the next two very busy weeks. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there eventually. I don't know about the next two weeks, but, okay. but thank you, sir. Good seeing you as well. You bet. That's Jason Lock and Four, my old NFL Network compadre. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.